from the sixth, sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Holy One, our God, the sacred, is one. You are to love the Holy One, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Let these words that I command you today be written in your heart. Teach them diligently to your children and repeat them constantly when you are at home, when you are walking down a road, when you lie down at night, and when you get up in the morning. Tie them on your hand as a reminder. Wear them as a circlet on your forehead and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Ancient words for our present day consideration. Well, we're doing a series on um, things that I believe that have fallen out of Christianity that were there once upon a time, particularly in, in Judaism. And they were pillars of sanity. Uh, last week, we looked at the, the divine name and saw that it wasn't a name like we think. There's a story of the burning bush. The, the, the letters that were put there were like symbols of being itself. So you had more of a sense of being called to the heart of life than something just religious or theological. It was an experience of the mystery of things. This week, we're looking at something that's called the Shema, uh, which why don't we go ahead and look at the first. This is kind of an interesting slide because uh, a lot of the people who condemn homosexuality have tattoos. And the same book that condemns homosexuality condemns con uh, uh, t t tattoos. So it's just kind of an interesting Thing. I always thought it'd be interesting to have a tattoo and have it, have it be just that verse that condemns tattoos, just <laughs> to blow somebody's mind. Um, but the word Shema is the first, it goes that direction, and it means to hear, to listen. So when you hear a Jewish person talk about the Shema, that's the first word, listen, hear. And then Israel is the second word, which we might translate people because um, it's been a while and lots of nations have taken up this teaching. So it's, it's true in a very unique way uh, for Israel, but uh, for, all, you know, for the whole world, for, for whatever group of people. That next word, the third word is the divine name again. And what's interesting is the, the vowels underneath the word, we're supposed to tell you what word you're supposed to say instead of that sacred name. So when they were reading it, they would look at the little two dots underneath it and the little T, and they would know that's Adonai. And instead of uh, the, the two words was uh, Adonai and Elohim, and they'd alternate. You'd say that instead of the divine name. So in scripture, when you see Lord God, that's a misunderstanding. Even more of a misunderstanding is the word Jehovah, where instead of realizing you're supposed to say something different, they took the, the consonants of the divine name and the vowels underneath them and came up with the word that no ancient person ever said. And the reason I say that is because they didn't have J's. So when somebody says the divine name is Jehovah, uh, they got a little schoolwork to do. So you have the divine name occurring twice, the, the word for God, which happens to be the plural, and then one. God is one. What does that phrase mean, that God is one? Certainly for many people, they believe their particular idea of God is the right one, and everybody else is wrong. That's one way of understanding this phrase. We're going to ask the question, is there some way to understand the idea of God being one, using the Shema to make it healthy and not this kind of narcissism of most religions. The belief that God speaks to your group 
and likes your group better than everybody else isn't a compliment to God. Right, that doesn't make God any bigger. It makes us bigger. Only universal love would make God bigger. Someone who, in some ways, is at the heart of all religions, however different they may seem. So, one of the first ideas to realize is that the Shema, you take this up before you do anything else. It says, write it on your sleeves, put it on your forehead, uh, put it on your doorpost. The next picture, when you see like uh, an Orthodox Jewish person, that little box on their forehead is the Shema. And then they have the same kind of thing down here with the arm. Before you can be religious, it's saying you have to understand this kind of basic tenet. When it says God is one, one way to understand that is like you had a magnifying glass. That the symbol God is a way of taking the personal love you have and making it universal. When you think of magnifying glass, uh, the idea of love for all people is really difficult for a human being, if not impossible sometimes. So the idea of a being who's above everything, who doesn't, is not limited by boundaries of nation or sect, it's important to realize that when somebody says America first, they've renounced this teaching. But can you imagine taking the love that you understand and making it apply to everybody everywhere? Symbols can help us do that. Symbols can extend our understanding in the situations. We may, we may not be able to live them out. We may not be able to feel that love. But it's a way of imagining that even though you and I can't get along, that there's some being that loves us both equally. That can be a way of operating at a higher level than we're used to. So to think of this Shema, this, before you even start religion, the idea that there's a unity that we all can participate in. Not that God is, my idea of God is better than your idea of God, but that both of our ideas of God are little bitty glimpses of a unity that the world is searching for. Imagine if somebody you can't love, you could sort of imagine loving them because you thought of a being who could. So the first thing I think the Shema helps us understand, like an alarm, like a, uh, uh, a magnifying glass, is that the unity of God does not mean loyalty to Christianity. It's not about sectarian religion. It's about universal love. So can we at least imagine a love larger than ours? The second, the Shema, I think is like an umbrella. I've mentioned this before. I love Eastern religions that the God's walking around with a, a, an umbrella. But it's like the mustard seed where it opens up into fullness. If God is one, and you see that the people that wrote the Shema originally didn't understand that because they told you stay away from other people's gods. If there's only one God, then those gods are also expressions of whatever that one unity is. If you're fighting other people's gods, then you believe in more than one God. So this idea of an umbrella that helps us open up ourselves that a God who is everywhere could only be served by us blossoming I can't grasp this idea of this fundamental unity any idea I have will be in conflict with your idea of unity we both have to imagine something deeper more profound that includes us both so this idea of an umbrella is to stop grasping at our idea of unity and dissolve into something bigger. 
In the Shema, it says, love with all of your heart, mind, and strength. There are different ways of translating it. But can you imagine instead of loving this being that you think of as God, if God is your source, then God is not the object that you love, it's the source of love. So when you love other people, that's in a sense your source loving through you. I know a lot of people who think they love God, and some of them are the meanest people you'd ever want to meet. What the Shema is saying is, it's okay to love with all of your heart. When somebody tells you you can't love certain people, or when they say certain types of love don't count, that's not loving with all of your heart. No one else can tell you how your heart loves, what your heart seeks. So widening our love, deepening our sympathy with other people is what the Shema calls us to. What would it mean to love with all of your mind? You certainly couldn't take up the propaganda of religion. You couldn't memorize creeds and call that knowing with all of your mind. So it's okay to take up science, reason. It's okay to look at things from other perspectives, study other religions. Anything that makes your mind blossom gives more glory to your source than being afraid that if you believe the wrong things, you'll go to hell. What a pathetic religion that is. What kind of a God could only sell love by holding a gun at your head? Right? You know it's not a good product when it's being sold with a threat. And what if you knew that you could love with all of your strength? That you weren't being asked to obey some rule. You were being asked to take responsibility for your world for your life and that you could live with courage not fear of hell not fear of making god angry at you but more of a sense of this parent that's rooting for you that, that wants you to be yourself that wants you to make your own decisions if god is one if god is everywhere then we can only serve that God by blossoming completely, loving with all of our mind, all of our heart, all of our strength. The third kind of metaphor for what the Shema does is that of an alarm clock. One of the most important things religion does is call us to the here and now. That sense of relationship, that sense of presence. When you read scripture, and you think you're reading about something that happened thousands of years ago, thousands of miles from here, it's hard for that to really mean much to you. You can pretend so that other people don't get mad at you. But what if the whole point of Scripture is to open you, to, to help you love more in the place you're at, that word uh, Shema, let's go to the next slide, please. This is a picture of a flame, but Shema is written into it. That's the S-H, Shema Yisrael. So there's a sense in which this is everywhere. And the reason that's important, the reason to say God is one means that God is everywhere is that means the search for God is over. If you realize that. You don't have to search for something that's everywhere. By definition, it's already here. To me, it feels completely different to think that God is hiding from me, or God is waiting for me to beg, or to say the right phrases. It's so much easier for me to realize that God is always here, just sometimes I'm not here. 
Sometimes I'm living in the past. Sometimes I'm living in the future. Sometimes I'm pretending to be what I'm not. But a religion that calls us to the here and now can experience love everywhere. One of the religions that helped me see this is Hinduism, which says, I think, a very similar thing. It says, God is the sacred one, hidden in all beings, all pervading, the self within all beings, watching over all works, dwelling in all beings, the witness, the perceiver, the perceiver, the only one. To say God is one, if we don't understand, is a very destructive idea. And there are few ideas that have brought as much bloodshed into the world as thinking that our idea of God is the only one. But there's no idea that I can think of that has a better chance of bringing unity to the world. That all of our religions and all of our anti-religions, all of our science, all of our philosophy, are expressions of a deeper unity. They're like rivers that are flowing to one ocean. The separateness brings richness to the conversation. They don't threaten one another. If they all understand, they're coming from and going to a deeper place. So uh, in this particular sermon in this series, the idea I want to get across is that people were told to memorize this Shema. Memorize these words. Put it on your forehead. Write it on your sleeves. Put it on your doorpost. Doesn't that sound like they thought it was important? I never heard about this in Sunday school. So what if instead of taking religion at face value, we hear it as a call to a deeper unity? So it's like a magnifying glass. It takes the little loves that we understand and helps us imagine a love that would include all beings. And secondly, that it was like an umbrella, that this God who is everywhere is best served by us magnifying ourselves, loving with all of our mind, loving with all of our heart and all of our strength. The idea of a God who gets threatened if you're too smart uh, is kind of pathetic. The source of love would want you to blossom completely. That would be the highest praise that they could receive. And then finally, that idea of an alarm clock. What a wonderful gift to realize whatever you're searching for, the sacred, is right here, right now. What if we put on our forehead, put on our sleeves, realize that religion doesn't make any sense unless you start here. Here, O oh people, the sacred is one for all of us. And you are to love with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Well, that's my understanding of this text. We'll take a moment for you to think about how you understand these words.